we hate blacks. Are you all right? One of my brothers was actually, um, he was actually a skinhead. He would go out with other skinheads and beat up black people. I'm just trying to give advice. I'm trying to coach people with the advice and the life skills that I've been given. And I got abused. <laughs> I got abused. Done Top of the Pops with Whitney Houston. Done stuff with Take That, Boyzone, E17, Spice Girls. Zidon bum bum wheeze, it did not they? The bum 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 brain, did it bum bum brain. When I was doing backing vocals for, um, Diana Ross, Glastonbury, Benny King, Robert Palmer, Percy Sledge, actually dated one of the Spice Girls as well. Oh, Zav. We <laughs> <laughs> you cannot dangle a carrot like that and not expect me to say, come on, which one? Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me, man. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm delighted you've come on. When I had in my head, I'm going to put a podcast together. Yeah. I mean, without guests, you've got no podcast. So I, I had to have in my head, who would I, who are the people that I'd really like on the most? Yeah. And you was right up there. I'm flattered that you've actually asked me. And um, initially I, I said to you, I was like, nah, I turned you down initially. I was like, bro, I'm not really doing podcasts and whatever else. And um, I suppose it's just because of like the perception of what podcasts are. People just want to go in there and just talk about themselves and me, 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 me. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. You know, I've got my little platform, which I speak to people on and I'm all right with that. But then you asked me again and it just, just something energetically. I was like, oh, go on then. And then I started to look into you and I was like, he's an absolute Geezer. <laughs> I was like, do you, what do you really want to do this, Sam? And I was like, oh, look, you know, what? I've I've been around all types of people. And um, I thought, you know what? No, I'm gonna do it. It will be, it will be, if anything, an experience. On the note of your initial, I didn't fancy going on a podcast because it's, you know, it's narcissistic and you're cool within you. Yeah. Which is the exact reason I wanted to spend some time with you because you're a solid man. And I think Appreciate particularly it. at the moment, the country needs more men like you and more men should gravitate to men like you and more men should share each other's strength amongst each other to build each other up. Agreed. And you're a life coach and you're a life coach that I've followed personally for as long as I can remember. I love your singing. I love your messages in the morning on your stories. And you, someone like you is good for someone like me. I'm a hundred miles an hour. Yeah. I'm a mad man. I'm manic. You're chilled, you're calm, and I knew I was going to enjoy today because I'm going to feed off your energy because it is about you and you're not here because you've put your hand up and said, I want to talk about me. You're here because I said, please come on and talk about you, Zav. <laughs> yeah. So if we can, because mm -hmm. all your followers that gravitate to you and find strength and comfort and joy, yeah. I mean, you, you give a lot of love and entertainment out of there. You, you sing to your, to your followers. Let's tell them things about you that they don't know before we get into the mindset. So let's take it right back to where are you from? Where, where were you born? Wembley boy, Alberton specifically, um, born in 1969, 54. People don't believe that I am, but I'm like, I am. And I earned every one of those years. Um, I'm the youngest of um, seven children, five older brothers, one um, sister, she's passed now. Most people didn't grow up with their mum and dad. And my dad and my mum, they lived, um, they were married for some like nearly 60 years. So I'd always had mum, I'd always have dad. And so I'd always, I grew up in a very amazing household, very balanced. Um, the banter was off the charts. Um, six boys, one room, three bunk beds. So ultimately I was, um, in a room listening to five older people speak about life. And I was just like downloading and downloading. And in the first seven years of your life, you're downloading anyhow. I didn't have to fight much because uh, my brothers were, were the boys. They were the man. We were like the Barnett family. Everybody knew about the Barnett family. I had a, a phenomenal upbringing. I really did. I can't complain. I, 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 and I feel bad sometimes when people talk to me about their upbringing and I'm like, damn, that's really sad. I can't relate to that because mine is amazing, but um, I can empathize obviously. So from a good, strong Christian family, my dad was a pastor, my mum was an evangelist. 
So um, yeah, that's me in as in my younger years, and that um, gave me a great foundation to just kind of like be whatever I wanted to or do whatever I wanted to do from there. It's interesting. You answered the next question that I was going to... I've got when a you, bad habit of doing that, by the way. Well, no, it's, it's perfect. It makes my life easy and it makes it... It's just enjoyable. It's like perfect. I wanted to know that. I was going to say the fact that you've got five older brothers, Yeah, that had to have been your, your apprentice leg to make you so knowledgeable in life where you can now pass the baton on to others and help them. You can now be their bigger brother. Totally. And I was bullied by my brothers. And if I'm going to get bullied by anyone, I'd rather it be them because they loved me, they understood me, and there was things that I was doing that they were trying to get out of me before I went on the streets and the streets did it to me. I didn't even see it as bullying. I shouldn't even use that word to be honest with you. My brother's gonna be like, what are you bullying? But um, they educated me and I learned so much things at home that I didn't have to go out on the streets and make those mistakes. I heard, sat down and listened to my brothers um, go through, I mean, my brothers used to go, um, one used to go Chelsea um, from in the seventies. The other one used to go to Arsenal. And the, literally it was like, we hate blacks, but you're all right. <laughs> that was my brothers. <laughs> one of my brothers was actually, um, he was actually a skinhead. Literally he had the Arrington jacket. He had the um, DMs, short, um, uh, like rolled up jeans and all that kind of stuff. And he would go out with other skinheads and beat up black people. So I'm like, make that make sense. He's like, no, 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 it's not that I would do that. It's just that some of them are out of order, some of them. So I got this real unbelievable, crazy mixture of like the racism and religion and men and women and what fighting and loving and all types of thing at a very, very early age. That's insane that your your <laughs> really that your that your brother would say some of them are out of order, referring to black people. Yeah, as a black man himself. Correct. Wow, who got their claws into him? I think it was just about the perception that we had. I mean, it didn't last long, thankfully, but it's the perception that we had of ourselves, and I think that you become like the environment that you find yourself around and in. And because of uh, my brother was bullied. A lot of them were not bullied. They were attacked by mods, skinheads, um, teddy boys, hillbillies and whatever else. And because my brothers were like strong, they're very good specimen of, strong specimen of men. And, and they would batter these guys and we would, they would go out and literally football matches and it, literally there would be a whole bunch of, I was going to call some footballers named like um, the West Ham boys and all that, but there'd be a whole load of violence. And they would always stand up. And the beautiful thing about that, just going for tangent, is you can get in a fight with 50 geezers and everybody walks away from there, goes home to their family and friends and whatever else. Because it was just about having straighteners. Mm. And my brothers learned that from a very early age and I learned that from an early age as well. But it's just that when you hear people talking a certain way and you heard skinheads talking like this and this and all that kind of stuff, then you tended to believe them because that's what you were surrounded by. And you're like, okay, cool. And then when I speak to my brother now, he's like, oh, it's just a phase. Just going for a phase, that's it. And I'm like, cool, glad you came out of it, you know? <laughs> yeah, that, that phase won't benefit in anybody. Yeah. Do you think racism has evolved or dissolved over, over, the, over the years, current it's, day? It's evolved. And I mean, anything that you, um, that you jump on top of, it doesn't necessarily disappear. It just kind of like dissipates into quieter streams into, uh, I mean, people internalize it a lot more. And back in the day, um, racism was on television. So you'll sit down and you watch people like Jim Davison and, you know, they'll be coming out with their chalky stuff and whatever else. And you'd, you'd have to deal with it as a way of just being, you know? Um, it was like, okay, you know, that whole thing, like sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. And it's like, it's just words, it's just words. And I'm like, that's the biggest lie. Sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will scar you, mm. which they have. And I mean, I deal with people now, um, we'll talk about later, but um, who are dealing with scars from words that were um, said to them. Um, the difference for us in the whole um, racism thing is that we were, um, we were able to, vent our frustrations physically and we'd fight. We'd fight all the time. And then after a period of time, it started to dissipate a lot more and more and more. And people just became less accepting of racism. But it never bothered me 
the way that it would have had I had not had older brothers. If it was just me, racism would have been a problem. Mm. And I probably would have been fighting all my life. But because of the fact that my brothers, they circumnavigated it, they they bullied the bullies, if you will, the racists. Then I was like, oh, you're not even, there's nothing even about you. I'm good. So that helped me to deal with that. It helped me to empathize to a degree in regards to racism. Um, I've traveled to countries where I'm the first black person um, natives to that country have seen, one being Japan, another being, another being in um, the hills of Italy in 1994. And I came out of the, um, I came out of a tour bus and a person stood at, look, a, a kid, a, a kid and a mum, young girl and, a, and a, her mum, this kid must've been about four or five, stood there looking at me like that. And I was like, hello, it was like this. And I was like, okay. And then I realized it's not racism, obviously, but it's just that they've never actually encountered a black person in real life. And what happens when you, you had three channels back then, and then it went to channel four, then it went to the porn channel and um, channel five. Um, and then literally when you were, if you were looking at the narrative that the TV showed you, black people were X, Y, and Z, whatever the narrative they put out there. And then when people started meeting me and my brothers and whatever else, they was like, you guys are mad cool. You guys got banter, you know, you, you, you can hang, you support the same team we support. And then it just literally started to dissipate. And it's like, I don't like black people, but I like you. So that's, that doesn't make sense to me. And I was like, well, now you're learning. Well, some of the top things that I wouldn't want to be branded, one of them would be a racist because yeah. it's it's ignorant and I I credit myself with a certain level of intelligence yeah. where ignorance just isn't a part of that. I'm open, I'm broad, and I'm interested in everybody. Yeah. Well, then the race card is lazy as well. It's lazy. And I've been, I'm undeniably black. And I've had um, people, and with dreadlocks as well, which makes it even worse because you just stand out. And I've had people say, yeah, I can't because I'm black and I can't this because I'm black and I can't this because I'm black. And I'm like, okay, cool. But I've done this, that, that, this, that, 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 that. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah. In spite of being black, now what's your excuse? So then it's like, okay, cool. Even if that is it, why would you want that to be your excuse? Whatever it is, whether it's a disability, whether it's your female, you're short, you're tall, whatever. Why would you want that to be an excuse? So then... In challenging that in my mind, I'm like, yeah, I need to set myself free from that. It's actually a blessing to be who I am, what I am, experience what I have. And I don't look at it as a negative. And it's, that's about perspective and perception, isn't it? It's a construct that was created a very long time ago that made a lot of people very wealthy. So I absolutely understand, appreciate and accept that racism exists. What I won't do is feed into it and I won't um, cower into the corner because you are attacking my race. I won't do that. You know what I mean? I'll come out bigger and brighter and stronger. So there is that, but you know, it depends on how you want to navigate that. You know, I'd like to see less of the race card being pulled because it's now watering down how powerful and disgusting that word is. Because if you are a genuine bonafide racist, yeah. you need to be called out and you should be exposed for who you are. If you literally dislike somebody yeah. because of the color of their skin, you're a dog and you should be exposed or you should at least be sat down and spoke to. Educated. Like, like they're at school. Naughty, naughty. That's not how it works around here. Yeah. So the fact that people throw that word around like confetti, it's it's doing the word no justice because the word's powerful and yeah. the word's ugly and it, and we need less of that in Correct. the world. So the less it's thrown around, the more serious the word will be taken and maybe we can we can do something about it. Yeah, I've um I grew up, like I said I grew up in the um in the seventies and in the eighties when um when racists were you know they were they were racist and they were good at it as well and they were passionate about it. And they they held they they didn't hold back in any way shape or form, um, and then when people now talk about racism, I'm like, that's a luxury compared to mm. what it was. But again, now and hopefully we'll get into this. We've become so attached to our feelings; it's incredible. Mm. It's incredible, and I can destroy a community right by saying words that will get them emotional in their feelings. 
And I think that that's, that's too much. How are you allowing people to control you just because you're sat in your feelings as opposed to just kind of being your logic? So when, I mean, I've been places and, and people have called me the N-word and whatever else and I've started laughing and they've been like, huh? And, they, and they've said the word again and I goes, nah, that's not me because if that was me, you wouldn't still be standing. Mm. And they're like, okay, that didn't get the desired effect. And I rolled out because I know that you're not going to take me out of my peace and out of my comfort zone and out of my joy and happiness by using a word. I don't, that doesn't fit. Like, you know, they say if the hat fits, wear it. That doesn't fit me. If we, if you want to have a strength and we can do that. And, you know, I rape myself, I, I back myself, but then I'm like, for what? Because you called me a name. I'm, I'm all right with that. Whatever, man. You know? I told you you was a cool cat. <laughs> I told you, this is what, this was the vibe that, that, I, that I gravitated to. It's like, yeah, you think that's going to trigger me? Yeah. I'm in control of my emotions. There you go. That's powerful. So you back yourself in a fight and I think every man should have that, that inner belief. Yeah. And if they're, sort of, if they're lacking that confidence, inner belief or capability, I think now's quite a good time to get into, not that we're going to go down that route, but I think yeah. a martial art or boxing or just some weightlifting, just do something that makes you feel more manly. If you are if you feel inferior in certain areas, like zone in on that because it, it's important to feel like a man now with, with the, the added pressure that we've got out there. Here's the question though. What is a man? In my humble opinion? Yeah. I mean, the starters, he's got to have one penis, two balls. <laughs> First and we foremost, went there. <laughs> I'm not mad at you. <laughs> but first and foremost, that's that's a man. If you're if you're asking what I think a man's obligation is for me, it's to be strong. Fill your own cup first, so it overflows, so you you can then water other people, mm -hmm. predominantly the people that you love and support in your family. I think you need to be strong enough and understanding enough that people can come to you with their problems and know that they can talk to you uh, in a non-biased fashion. I'm also very traditional and old school. Mm. So for example, when my partner, when we, when we moved in, when we moved into this house, I may have said two rules. <laughs> I may have said full belly, empty nuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, 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 the, that's the rules. But as a whole, traditional, I want, I want peace. I, I want a woman to provide me with peace, tranquility, relaxation, love and support. Yeah. And for me, I'm going to be the one that goes downstairs if I hear any noises, if right. there's a potential intruder. And I'm also going to be the one that goes to work, that earns the money, that pays for the food, that pays for the bills and pays for the house. So I think a man from a non-biological point of view, which is obvious, we yeah. get, that's another topic, but to us, I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> again, I think a man, in my opinion, I get the most pleasure from being a man by being a protector and a, and a provider. Oh, provider. That's me. You're old school. I'm a bit older than you. And we both appreciate it from that, that basic platform, that basic foundation, which has been created by our fathers, our fathers before them. The issue is a man now is fluid. So a men, a men don't know what men are with the Me Too movement and whatever else. It's very difficult to understand, especially if you came from a household where you didn't have a father, you didn't have a male um, subject to, um, to look up to, if, as it were. I had five and then my dad, six. My sister used to look after me because um, she is the oldest. It's just how it works in the family. And incredible woman. My mum, also incredible woman. So I've always had phenomenal um, examples of what a man is and what a woman is. So for me, it's easy. For you, it's easier. Even though, not, you know, um, speaking in your story, you know, I've heard some toxic um, mm. elements, which is also good because you get to understand what it's not. And then you can see what it is. So for me, um, having such a balanced environment to grow up in, it's, it's blessed. But the issue nowadays is young men don't know what a man is. Women don't know what women are. 
and you're told to fight against everything. You're told to battle everything and you're in your feelings like we're going back to. And then if you tell me what you feel, then that's going to constantly change depending on the atmosphere and the environment as opposed to what you know. But then what do you know? And that depends on what you've been taught. Well, what have you been taught? Because dad weren't around and mum weren't around all this. And then you get this whole confusion. Then you have to now start to educate, hopefully, people into understanding that what you've grown up around doesn't have to be what you now define yourself as, as a grown up, as it were. So you are the man you are today because you were shown everything that you should be, mm -hmm. and you took that, and you didn't ignore that, which a lot of people, they, they don't realise the blessings that are surrounding them, all the Correct. lessons they're being taught. It's like, roll with that. And I'm the why I am today, because I was shown by my dad everything not to be. Yeah. So I was focusing on what not to do. Yeah. He was focusing on what to do. So you could sort of say, really, despite how hard you have it or, or how easy you have it, the choice and the onus is on you to make the right decision to get to where you want to be. Here's, here's the interesting thing about what you said. Me and you start off completely two, two completely different places. You go through trauma to get to where you're going to. I go through bliss to get to where I'm going to. We end up at the same place, but just in different conditions. I got, um, like for argument's sake, there's a guy that, I, a friend of mine, and he wrote this book about how he was abused by his mum. And he goes to me, I want you to proofread it. So I was reading through the book and I, and I was laughing. And he's like, what part are you laughing at? And I goes, when your mum took tools to, um, to, to reprimand him, to beat him, to whatever. And I was, and I was laughing at it. He goes, what are you laughing at that for, bro? That's, that's weird. And I goes, no, 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 I'm not laughing at that. I'm laughing at, because that's what happened when I was a kid. And he's like, what do you mean? I goes, I got that when I was a kid. I got told to go out and choose the weapon that my dad was going to use to beat me. And we used to have to go and take bamboo sticks. And he's like, what? I goes, yeah. I goes, good times, man. <laughs> and he's looked at me and he's like, bro, that, that traumatized me. I goes, here's the thing. If you are getting beaten up by yourself, it's trauma. If you are in a fight collectively, it's like fun because it's not just you getting it. So I get it when it's directed at one person, but if it's a few, it's just that kind of like collective thing where it's not just directed at me. So it's not as though you hate me because you're doing it to him, 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 him. So my dad would be all my brothers. And I was like, well, we're just as bad then. Cool. We're bad together. And we would get in trouble together and all that kind of stuff. So I get it when people say stuff which was abusive, I experienced, but I didn't view it as abuse. Mm. I viewed it as them reprimanded me. I was a, I wasn't a good kid. I was a bad kid and we did bad stuff. So my parents used to say, we're going to do it to you so that the police doesn't have to, because if you go out on the street and do that, you're not going to embarrass us on the street. My um, West Indian families were heavy on that. Mm. You're not going to embarrass us on the street. And ultimately it was just like a way of, my perspective of growing up, being around that kind of stuff was just like, I can look at that from a negative or positive and which one benefits me. So you and me are where we are today and we've had very different journeys. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that we haven't got in common. Correct. But I would say that the thing that we, that we have got in common through our journeys was that we learned. We looked, we listened and we learned. Important especially if you actually want to progress and you want, and you want to develop, like if you look around you, most days there's a lesson. The answers are there right under your nose. But if you're choosing to look past them and not yeah. sit in that sadness for a moment or reflect or look at yourself properly, then you're just going to keep moaning, making excuses, feeling the same way you did the day before because you've done nothing different. I think that's what we've done. We've, we've, we're in the, we're, we are where we are now, different journeys, but we, what we have done the same is look, listen, and, and, and we've learned. There's this thing where the whole victim mentality, let's just go there. And that keeps you stuck in a situation that keeps you stuck in the spot. One thing that I didn't do was stay too long in trauma, stay too long in lack, stay too long in, um, and I did this thing where I didn't do it. My brothers did this thing where they were, they will beat me up for doing something and then it will, and I'll be crying. They're like, stop crying. And then they'll ask me to do something for them. Like, go and grab me this. 
And I didn't, I'm, I'm not doing it. Then I get beaten up again. And what it taught me was recover quicker. Why are you sitting in that thing? What is the benefits of you sitting in that trauma, in that, in that whatever it is? And I would recover really quick. So, I mean, and it's a lesson that I teach my, I taught my son, but I'm like, okay, I can recover from this really quickly because the only thing that's keeping me there is my thought off the thing. Mm. It's gone. That lasted a millisecond. Now me replaying it makes it, makes it last for months, years. If, if you, like you said, you got, um, you got abused by your father, your father is not abusing you. He abused you. But every time you recall that, your body doesn't know the difference between whether it's a thought or an action. It just responds, it reacts. So then you start getting that, that bile in your stomach and the adrenaline goes and then the cortisol goes racing through your vein. And you can make yourself angry based on something that happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Mm. So I'm saying, cool, what are the benefits? Which is a question that I ask myself every day, by the way, at least a thousand times. And I, when I get into things that stress me out or memories of things or a situation that I'm stressing, I go, okay, cool, fine. You're right. Everything that you said is correct. What are the benefits? And I can't tell you any. Well, I can tell you there is none. And I can make you 100% right there from personal experience. As you can see now, we're chatting, we're calm, we're cool, we're working things out, we're having a good time. Yeah. So two podcasts I've been on recently, they go, obviously, they want meat on the bone. Of course they do. So they go straight into the, into the obvious, the dark, the dark, the deadly, the ugly. My dad, your abuse, his connection with the gangsters and all the rest of it. And as soon as I start talking, and day-to-day -day life, let me just make this absolutely clear, it's important that Zab's message really resonates with people. Giving something oxygen, you're giving it life, and it's living within you. Uh, you got to... You got to exercise that demon. So I wouldn't give him the power. Like he's lost that power. He's yeah. lost that he's not in me. But obviously when when it's brought up and I'm on a podcast and it's topic of discussion, fuck and I'm like this. And everything changes. The anger comes out of me. I, you know, it affects me because he's now alive again. Yeah. I'm now feeding the beast again. Yeah. But I know what I'm signing up to when someone says, Do you want to come on a podcast? I, you know, if it's the like Terry Stone's criminal connection. Yeah. I, I know what he wants to talk about. So no problem, but it's, I can just concur with you and confirm that what you're saying is 110% accurate yeah. because I've done it and I feel it. So, so you now did. So, so here's the me. thing. Here's the thing. And it's, and, and I'm, and I'm, thank you for um, appreciating that as well. It's not real. It's not happening. But because we connect to it and we are convinced and we literally return back to that moment, it becomes real again. And now you have to start from right now. So what happens is I process and, and I've learned to do it just because again, children should be seen and not heard. And I spent most of my life shutting up and listening. Literally, you know, that whole thing, you've got two ears and one mouth because whatever else. But I literally spent a lot of time listening. So I learned so much. I absorbed so much. And one of the things that I understood was um, when you are processing this stuff, if you process it as a person who's viewing it and not as the person who it's happened to, you have a better relationship with it. So I can talk about traumatic stuff and I'm not traumatized because I know it's not happening. And I keep telling myself cognitively, it's not happening. That happened. It's not happening. That happened. You keep rehashing the same trauma. Mm -hmm. You're just going to be relieving it again. Simple. It, and it doesn't... Okay, so it's gone. Past is history. The future's a mystery. Today is your gift. That's why it's called a present. It's a very nice line that I really appreciate. But the only thing you have is now. And in your now, you get to look at your past and, and have a different perspective of your past, right? And you get to, in your now, create your future. But the future you don't have and the past you don't have, you only have your now. So you can decide what you do only in your now, unless you've got a time machine. And if you find one, I'm coming. Mm. So in your now, you do this thing where that happened to me, that happened to me, that happened to me. Cool. How do you feel about that crap? Right. How do you want to feel about it? 
what you mean? How do you want to feel about it? I don't get it. You can choose how you felt about that thing in the past. And you can choose for that thing to have been an excellent learning curve or a benefit now or whatever, because it's gone. And then you benefit in your now and then you take that into your future. But again, like we've got into um, the whole victim thing and, you know, for when it comes to, um, we started off in the whole racism conversation when people use that thing, well, I'm, this happened to me and that happened to me and that, and I'm like, cool, but what are the benefits? And if there are no benefits, let it go, man. Mm. And it's like, yeah, but how do I let it go? I said, cool, perfect. Picture it, visualize it, understand that it is not happening and then let it go. And every time it comes up, keep letting it go. And I mean, I've worked with over a thousand clients in the last five years of doing this. And um, it's phenomenal, the change that has um, occurred in some people that are willing to take accountability for what happened and are willing to release themselves from what happened. And then there are people that will never change because that's who they are. And if I let go of that, then who am I? Like whoever you want to be, mm. just not that, because that doesn't benefit you. You see what I'm saying? The simple things are sometimes the most powerful. And I've never thought of it like you did. Yeah. It's happened. It's not happening. That's a short sentence I'll take with me forever now. Beautiful. And I'm pretty good at understanding myself because A, I'm accountable and B, yeah. I like working things out and I like to know my flaws because I want to be a better person. Yeah. So I'll always look, what can I improve in me? So I haven't got my, I haven't got it all sewn up by any stretch. Yeah. And the more I know that, the more I learn, the more I realise, the less I knew. Always it, a student. Yeah, always. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know what? This is why I'm doing these podcasts and why I've reached out to people like you. Yeah. Because I want to learn. Because I know that the only way to get ahead is to learn. Yeah. There's only so much that we we can juggle about and process and make sense of up here. Sometimes you've got to go, hey, let me pick your brain. Yeah, and you've got, yeah, you've got a great brain to pick. <laughs> yeah. Let's pick. Go on. Yeah, ahead. let's pick it. Okay, well, so this morning, checked into Xavier, the life coach. I thought, what's he going to say today? And you were speaking about friendships. Yeah. I'm big on friendships. Yeah. I, I pride myself as a best friend. Yeah. And th there's not many things that I'll, uh, I'll give myself a pat on the back at. I'm humble in most areas, mm -hmm. but I'm telling you now, I'd like, I'd like most people to find a better friend than me. I love my friends like family. We're, we're going to have to battle over that one because I think I'm the best friend that a friend could have. We can call it a draw. <laughs> We can call it a draw. Right, go on, then, go on. Then. We drew but, on that one. So, and we sh so we share the same the same the same views on friendship. That, that yeah. It's important. So, I was wondering. You was talking in your, in your video this morning, and again, I, you know, every now and again, if you're growing, if someone's not growing with you, they've got to go. Yeah. No, no one wants to be weighed down. So, your the meaning of your video earlier was basically you've got to know when to hold them and when to fold them. And you could have been friends with somebody for 10, 20, 30 years. And there comes a time where if they're not sort of meeting you halfway, if there's no exchange of value, yeah, then yeah. maybe it's time to make new friends. That was the gist I got from it. So I thought yeah. maybe you could compound on that. There's a lot of people that I had as friends who, when I was successful in their eyes, I mean, because I just believe I'm a successful stop. But when I'm successful in their eyes or what their perception of success was, they were around and it was available. Some people, when you become successful, they disappear because they can't handle the fact that you're doing really well. They don't mind that, but better than them, then now they become an enemy. They become the daggers. I remember you and I remember this. And then now the manipulation starts. Oh, you've changed, bro. Now you've got money, you've changed. Um, and one that people say to me, oh, oh, so because you got, um, because you got 10, 20, 30, 40,000 followers, you think you're it. And I'm like, no, but you do. That's why you mentioned it. Mm. And now that you've said it, I'm actually going to have to downgrade you. I appreciate the whole friendship thing, but there's a lot of people that are suffering because of friends that are toxic. And I see it too much. And I'm like, they're expired. They're like, literally, if they had an exploration date on them, you would be vomiting because they they died about four years ago and you're dragging them into your life or keeping them in your life because of what happened 20 years ago. And you've got a trauma bond or you've got a happy bond because it doesn't have to be negative all the time. There's something that, you, that happened 
15 years ago. Oh, I remember when we used to do this. You remember when we did that? And we're at school. You remember that? And, oh. and you're like, cool, that was then. How are you now? Do you benefit me now? Have you grown? Have you excelled in any way, shape or form? Because if you haven't, then all you're going to do is drag me back to what you remembered. And that might be a good time, but it was like, come on, bro. Come on, girl. Yeah, you've got to bring something to the table. And also, if you're expecting somebody to bring something to the table, you've got to be prepared to bring something to the table yourself. So it's not like you're you're asking people for things that you're not prepared to give. Yeah. And I've uh, I've cut off friends as well. And what you're saying is, again, every, everything you're saying, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm with you there 100%, 100%. Yeah. I make you right. And then people are like, yeah, back in the day, and again, that that whether it's a trauma bond or a joyful bond, whatever yeah. it is, there, there's a there's a you had that connection there. It doesn't mean you need to have that person twenty years later that's bringing you down, putting you down, sort of covertly fucking with you. Mm. You just want your boys to be your boys and have your back. And if you're excelling, yeah, you want them to just pat you on the back, keep going, yeah, don't stop until you get to where you want to be. Yeah, jealousy. That's what we were saying earlier about yeah. about jealousy. jealousy. I've cut off some toxic people, or certainly toxic to my environment, because I knew that there's no mileage anymore. And yeah. no matter what we've been through, and it's certainly not that I feel like I'm better than them. Yeah, I just know that they're no longer a good energy. Good. The second I spot anything toxic, and this goes for family members as well. Yeah, I think people feel so obligated because they had a, a previous bond to just stick with that person till yeah. death do us part. It's like, it's not your wife. And even yeah. if you're related, remember, you didn't ask them to be your family member. That's by chance. If they're not bringing something healthy and positive uh, and lovely and beautiful yeah. to, to your life, you just got to think, is this the life I want to lead forever? The, the issue is, is on top of what you said, is your success exposes their failures. and that's a difficult pill to swallow because we came from the same place. So I, I can't even make an excuse. We had the same start. We did the same things. And why are you excelling and why am I not? The issue is also dead weight. Try to drag people into a place that they don't want to be. And I've seen too many people do that. I've seen too many people in a relationship try to make a guy something that he clearly isn't. Try to make a girl something that she clearly isn't. Ultimately, you've come in by yourself and you're going to leave by yourself. So it's why are you, why are you pausing everything for somebody that quite clearly you can't help? Yeah, I focus on very much how I feel towards another person's actions or success. But if you expect nothing, mm -hmm. everything else is a, is a bonus. There you go. You can't dictate what somebody does to you. What they do is what they do, but you can dictate what you, you respond to and how you respond. And I think no response is the most powerful response there is. Incredible. Mm. Incredible. Mm. Especially when, like you said earlier on, you're dealing with narcissists. Ignoring them is one of the worst things you can do to a narcissist, but it's important that you do. It's actually the one thing that you need to do mm. if you do that you needn't do anything else yeah especially if it's an abusive one so we all have narcissistic traits every one of us the mere fact that me and you are sat down here and we're saying to people listen to us talk there's a, <laughs> let's, let's be clear there's an element of narcissism in this yeah let's just be really clear let's get on it that. right yeah mm. so everybody has elements of narcissism that's just that's just what it is so when somebody calls me a narcissist i'm like Okay. And I, so what was that supposed to do? Was, it, was I was supposed to cry and fall into bits? Oh, you're manipulative. Okay, I can be. Yeah, but that's really wrong. So somebody is trying to jump off a bridge and I'm trying to tell them not to jump off a bridge and try to tell them that's called manipulation. But they're happier that I did it after they've come off the bridge. And they're like, Oh, so I go, so you can't just say stuff and expect me to be upset because you used the bad word, especially if it's not true. But if it is true, I'm like, cool, I am a narcissist. But I'm manipulative. Manipulation and persuasion. Is there is there much difference in there? I would see for me, I would I would perceive manipulation as an as an ugly as an ugly way of describing persuading somebody to do the wrong thing. So manipulation, persuasion, similar things. But for me, I will, if I'm, I think 
Persuading is trying to encourage, whereas manipulate is trying to sort of destroy in a convincing manner, either or. They're cousins. They're mm. bedfellows. And one we have um, a positive connection to and the other one we have a negative connection to. I've manipulated people in the past for their own good. The thing for me is, is where are you doing it from? What's your foundation for doing what you're doing? Because I can smack you, right? And you'd be like, thank you, Zev. And then somebody else can smack you and then you're under arrest because you because of what you've done to them. Because if somebody slaps you because you're being an idiot or because you need to wake up or because you, then it's like, it's acceptable. And another person slaps you and it's like, it's, it's still a slap, bro. But it's like, yeah, but it's where it came from. Mm. It's the purpose behind it. So that's my, that's my thing. It's what's behind it. It's where is it coming from? Is it coming from love? Is it coming from hate? Is it coming from anger? Where's it coming from? So if you can understand where that's coming from, then it's a lot more acceptable. It's easier to deal with. Personally, I have no problem with, with either word because okay. this is from a personal standpoint, but I understand it and I, like to unpack things. Yeah. I have got the power of persuasion and I can be manipulative. But as you said, it comes from what I believe the right place. Now, for example, I'm never going to use any names, but I've ne nearly lost friends because of them abusing drink and drugs and sitting in hotel rooms for seven, eight days on the trot without a wink's sleep. Their, 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 their mum can't get them off the drink and drugs, their son, their family, no one can. I have come in and you can call it manipulation or you can call it persuasion or you can even call it bullying. I don't give a shit. I've done whatever it took to make sure I didn't get a call one day to tell me that one of my best friends is dead. Correct. So I did use all of those, all of those traits yeah. to bring them out of that hole they were in. So the manipulation, the persuasion, the bullying, it come from a place of love. Yeah. I cannot see you destroy yourself anymore because it's hurting me, selfish reasons as well, but it's also hurting everybody else around you. And you're worth more than that. You mm. don't want to go out in the fucking, in the hallway of a hotel from a drug overdose. Yeah. You want to be remembered as a hero because that's beyond all the shit he was doing. That's who he is. Mm -hmm. And I used all of those tactics. And I'll, and I'll wear manipulation on that gladly with a ba like a badge of honour. Yeah. So that's perception and perspective, if you will. Mm. Right. And so when people say it's bad, I'm like, give them that example. Is that bad? They're like, well, no, because, okay, so it's bad or it isn't bad. Which one are you giving me? Which one are you giving me? Mm. And then you start understanding now it's where it comes from. When my dad used to beat us as children, right, did he hate us? No. Was he trying to reprimand us? Was he trying to stop us from doing stuff? Yeah. I think the world could do with a little bit more tough love. Yeah. I've had it given to me before myself. I was I was overdoing the partying scene yeah. years back. I mean, I was introduced to drugs in a, very differently to how most people are yeah. by my own dad, but people have heard that crap 101 times. But talking of friendships and doing the right thing and tough love, which is important now because it, this nanny state we live in and we're too we're too scared to scare anyone yeah. and make people feel uneasy. Sometimes you've got to tell someone, listen, and Fred done it to me, done it to me. He, put, he pulled me. You're partying too regular, you're partying too hard and you're partying for too long. I'm worried about you. It's not a good look. No one had ever said that to me before because I'm the one people come to with their problems. Yeah, And I took note of that. He didn't laugh it off or join in with me. It's like, it ain't good, Liam. Good. And I'll always love and respect him for doing that. And who knows? That could have been subconsciously the message that that resonated the most, yeah. even if it even if it sunk in a year later. Yeah. The words were said, the message was received, then action was taken eventually. Yeah. Most of the stuff goes into your subconscious which is where we spend 95% of our time in our subconscious mind. This is um, um, Dr. Joe Dispenza. The 95% of your subconscious is like redundant habits that we constantly repeat, things that we've learned from when we're kids that we do over and over and over and over again. And now your body knows how to do it better than your mind does. You just do it reactively. So if you've programmed or if you accepted bad things in your mind, right, or in, in that program, then bad things are just going to const constantly happen. So what that guy said, he kind of like put a glitch in the program. And it's like, no, now it's been challenged. And just by doing that, it makes you present. And then now the subconscious is like, 
wow, what happened there? Why aren't we enjoying this anymore? And it's like, well, maybe we should consider it. So then now you're using the 5% to battle the 95%. And the more you think about it in your now moment, the more you release yourself from it. So yeah, he did a really good thing then. Have you always been interested in the mind? No choice, but yeah. And and like I said, it, it stemmed from being a child. I would just always be listening. So I was working out life in my head via my brothers. So everything that they would talk about, I wouldn't have done that. Oh, that was a good idea. Oh, that's funny. Oh, I wish I could have done that. And then just programming, programming, programming. And I didn't realize that it was that. At 13 years old, I said to my dad that I want to be a psychiatrist. And my dad said to me, nah, that's too big for you. I'm like, what? And fast forward to now, I'm doing exactly now what I said I wanted to do when I was like 13 years old. That That's where it all came from. Just like having these connections and having these this input and then deciding, what do I want to do with this? What do I want to do? This? Where do I want to put it? I've got this wealth of knowledge that these guys have downloaded into me from the time. And you stop, you stop downloading by the time you're seven, pretty much. And this is what scientists have um, discovered. And then you start living your life. The interesting thing is, is that I wasn't living my life. I was living theirs because it wasn't my life. It was theirs. I downloaded their life, their program. So then for you as a kid, you downloaded your dad's program. Your dad's like, that's not yours, it's your dad's. So a lot of the stuff that you was doing was your dad's. A lot of the stuff I did was my brother's. So then you're struggling, but it's like, well, what are you supposed to do? You haven't created you yet. You're gonna create you. So you learn how to create you via these methods. And then at some stage, you have to start defining you. And then that's where you make choices. That's where you make decisions. Most lazy people go back to what the program says. Hmm. And it's like, yeah, but my dad, this and I did. And it's like, cool, you're going back to the program. You get to define you, by the way. I think you should start. You're 50 now. You're whatever. And people just literally revert back to the old program, which they learn. So if I'm doing the maths, you, yeah. ch you changed your, your Instagram tag to Xavier the Life Coach five, six years ago. Yeah. And you're 54. Yeah. So it wasn't until you was late forties that you thought, hang about, I'm now going to shift and become the person I've always supposed to have been. Yeah. So let's be clear. It was a very, very, very difficult time because I defined myself by music, hmm. which I'd been doing for nearly 30 years and had a lot. I've had, I, I mean, I've had an incredible life. I will always say that. And I had an incredible amounts of fun in my, in my twenties, in my thirties and in my forties in the music industry. And Making this change from um, music to life coaching was, was gut-wrenching. It was gut-wrenching because I love music, but I just didn't love the industry. I didn't love what it was becoming. I didn't like the people anymore. There's certain people that hang around in a certain environment or whatever else, but it's like, nah, it's not the same anymore. It's not the same clubs. It's not the same people. It's not the same energy. You look the same, but there's just a completely different attachment to it. And then going into it, I got, I got abuse, which I was confused about. I'm like, why are you abusing me? And I'm saying that I'm here to help people. I ain't ask you for any money. I'm just trying to give advice. I'm trying to coach people with the advice and the life skills that I've been given. And I got abused. <laughs> I got abused. And it was, it was interesting because then it made me decide, do you really want to do this? Are you really about this? And I was like, of course I am. And then I had to, not had to, but I decided to um, go through all the abuse. And you were speaking earlier on, and it's one of the reasons why I closed my Instagram page is because I don't mind having um, debate, conversations, arguments, but I'm not just going to have random abuse by random people who come on my page because they're bored, mm. which has happened. There's a, there's a guy, I was put something on my page one time and this guy came along and he was like, why don't you just F off you F in and then use the N word. On my page, not in my inbox, on my page. Shamelessly. Literally. So I sat back and I was like, I'm going to murder this guy. <laughs> Literally. I'm like, doesn't he know who I am? <laughs> Did this just happen? So I yeah. deleted it. And I was like, nah. So I screen, because I screenshotted it, screenshotted it. And then I put it back up and I goes, um, which people don't, didn't realize. Um, I goes, please help me to find this guy. 
like verbal abuse, I don't mind this abuse and all that kind of stuff, but racial abuse, I will not accept. Thank you, please and thank you. Two hours later, I got the guy's number. Two hours later, people were like, if you want his address, I'll give you his address. And then I thought to myself, oh, my ego, and I just put it down for seconds. Ev. Let's talk about this. It's probably a little 15 year old kid mm. that's just having a bad day and he's taking it out on you. You're going to go and compound his day and then you're going to get yourself in trouble by, and I'm like, oh. and I didn't, but. My followers did, they abused this kid for ages and I blocked him and he he got through to a then friend of mine and said, please tell him that I'm sorry and here's what I did and blah, blah, blah. And then the guy became a fan, asked him why he did it. He just goes, because I just, I just having a bad day and, and I'm sorry and I just took it out on you. So it's one of the reasons why I was just like, do you know, I don't need that. I'm getting abuse anyhow, mm. but just don't want it randomly from just casual passerbys because then now you're, you're trying to put out 20 fires as opposed to some specific ones. At least they press that button to follow. Okay, cool. Now you're here. Let's talk. Let's battle. Let's do whatever, you know? If you, when you once you build a following on social media, you yeah. realise there's, there's a lot of hate out there. There's a lot of bitter people. And when I see trolls in the comments coming out with outlandish, just horrible comments, I feel sorry for them. I don't yeah. lose any sleep, yeah. but I think, fuck being you. Fuck being you. You must be really, really unhappy yeah. to do that, to go out of your way, to exert energy into, into putting quite a, a decent sentence together sometimes. Yeah. As well. some, some, sometimes <laughs> it comes from somebody with half a brain and you think, yeah. really? Shit, you must be. And then you just think they could be going through a divorce, a bereavement, yeah. you know, they've just been fired, lost their business. It could be a million and one reasons. A lot of the time trolls come out to play at night and yeah. I know they've had too much to drink. And I used to message him and in the morning, sorry, it's like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Just maybe don't, maybe being drunk doesn't suit you. Yeah. I protect myself from it, like I say. And um, I put myself in a, in a really, in a safe zone, which I've created that nobody can contaminate. Mm. You see what I mean? We, um, we're, we're both aware that everything is energy. Mm. And I give my energy towards things that are positive towards things that are ele that will elevate me. And if people start giving negative energy towards me, right, then I have to, I have to literally defend myself or protect myself at all times, essentially. So when you put yourself out there, you are open to all types of energies coming at you. And if you're not like, and, and a lot of people don't get it, but if you're not cognitive of that, you will be affected and infected by stuff that you're like, I don't know what's going on, what's happening to me and all that kind of stuff, but it's energy and it's it's a real thing, even though people don't accept it and they're like, oh, Zav, come on. But it's something that um, it's important to be aware of. Mm, I agree. Um, because I am acutely aware yeah. that it's all, everything's an energy. Yeah. Good, bad, ugly, and the bad and the ugly, you need to steer clear from and protect and shield yourself mm -hmm. from that kind of energy. It's it's more about just challenging narratives. And um I want because you said um when I started my page, I just wanted to challenge what people thought because I'm trying to help them to get their life right. The way how a, the way how a man thinks, so he becomes. If you can think right, you can become right. Um, if you are around the right people, the right environment, the right things, then you can become that. If you're around a bunch of criminals and gangsters and whatever else, then it's highly likely that you're going to become that. It's not a fact. It's not a definite. But unless you remove yourself from it in some way, shape or form, then you become that. So if you want to learn Spanish, you don't have to go and sit in a book, sit with Spanish people. You learn Spanish. So essentially it's the stuff that we download and I'm trying on a daily basis, download information to people. That's why I say 500 milliliters first thing in the morning, make sure that you stay hydrated. And people have called me the maddest thing and said, you've saved me Zav, because I didn't even realize that I was suffering from medical issues because I wasn't drinking enough water. And it's a daily reminder as to what to do. And it's just like these little things that I do, like the morning minute message, like at the end of the conversation, I go, I got you, man. Because- That's my favorite bit. Is that, <laughs> I thought your favorite bit was cornflakes, <laughs> digestives, and warm milk. They're neck and neck, but I love that. <laughs>
got you, man. I've been doing that at home. <laughs> I've been telling the missus, I got you, man. <laughs> and the, the thing is, that comes from my music, uh, my music life, because I understand that people hold on to little taglines and little things and whatever else. There's no way that you can't at least touch base on the on the music career because you've got a beautiful voice. You even you even sing what you're having for breakfast, which is which is beautiful. So yeah, run through your music career because people that have followed you for years, they're they're going to want to know about that because I've seen little videos of you singing here and there with, with different bands on different stages and different lead singers. And so how did that, how did that all become? Mm -hmm. In fact, just tell me the journey in your own words from start to finish, anything exciting in there worth yeah. talking about, worth mentioning, just go with it. And I'm just going to soak it all up and enjoy. I'm going to enjoy this bit now. Okay. So that all kicked off pretty much in 1991 when I'd um, left my um, career as a, um, electronic engineer. Um, they say that you have three careers in your life, they, whoever they are. Um, but my first was an electronic engineer, which I was doing for a long period of time, which was cool, did that from school, but made redundant from that particular job. So I just went traveling around the UK for a year, went to Wales, Scotland, Ireland, Northern Ireland. Absolutely, the UK is a, the United Kingdom is a beautiful place, by the way, mm. beautiful. Anyhow, traveled, came back, um, a friend of mine, um, a then friend of mine goes to me, Zav, what are you up to today? And I go, oh, nothing. She goes, why don't you come to the studio with me? We used to sing together as kids. I was like, okay, cool. Went to the studio. There's a particular guy that was supposed to be there. He didn't turn up. It's all fate. So she's like, there's like, um, where's, um, his name's Lane. Lane Gray, he, um, he, he done um, a garage track hall battle with Wookie. Um, but he didn't turn up. So um, they was like, oh, flip me, where is it? It's like, whatever. And then she goes, Zav, why don't you jump in? I was like, okay, cool. So then I jumped in the booth. I've always sang. So I put on the headphones and started singing. Cool. Came out of the booth about an hour and a bit later on. And she goes to me, you got to sign these forms. And I was like, what form? She's like, it's a release form. I goes, no, nah, you're my mate. It's cool, man. I was just hanging out. She's like, no, it's not for me. And I'm like, so what is it for? She's like, oh, for them and, you know, the company. And I was like, hold on, I don't understand. So why am I signing this form? She goes, to get paid. How can you get paid for this? She goes, yeah. I was like, how much? And she goes to me, 250. That was 1990, I think it was 1992. And I was like, say that again. <laughs> and she goes, get paid 250. I goes, I came in the studio, just hung out with you for an hour and then sang for an hour. And you're going to give me 250 quid for that because normal jobs, you had to work, obviously go back and forth and work. She's like, yes, yeah, we'll get paid. Signed the form, sent it off to them. And there's like, so I go, so what happened now? They go, they send you a, a check. Like they used to mm. send you a check. So I sat down, I was like, this is a lie. She said, she's a liar. It's a scammer. Got the check in. I was like, this is a real check. Ran to Abbey National, Abbey National put it in the bank and you had to wait five days for it to clear, five working days. And I was like, it's not going to clear. It's not going to clear. And then I went the next week, put my cash point card in. I was like, oh my goodness, it's in there. And I was like, so what's this then? It's like, it's the music business. And that was it. Dived in. Um, the guy who I did that session with, he was like, I really like you and I love your voice and all that kind of stuff. And he's like, I'm doing a compilation album. Would you mind being a part of it? I'm like, yeah. So, did this compilation album. I had, um, I was um, one of the featured vocalists is um, um, Xavier featuring For Real. And it was like a street hype album. Street Hype was the name of the album. They went out, done, really blew up on the underground. Lots of artists got signed from there. And then um, after that, I was just like, just continuously doing music, doing bits and pieces. I didn't really pay too much attention to it because I just thought it's just something to do. But then I started to get calls to do this thing and that thing. And I got Top of the Pops, um, done Top of the Pops with Whitney Houston, um, done um, people like Eagle Eye Cherry, done stuff with Take That, Boy Zone, E17, Spice Girls, actually dated one of the Spice Girls as well. Oh, Zav. We <laughs> <laughs> you cannot dangle a carrot Whee! like that and not expect me to say, come on, which one? So, funny story. Driving my um, driving home from the West End one day, um, driving in my Peugeot 205 CTI. And we actually saw one on the way here, by the way, a white one. I was like, I used to have one of those. Um, driving home on the, um, the A40, um, this car comes alongside me, two birds are in the car. And one looks over and goes, hey, and I looked over and I'm like, all right. 
And she goes, she goes, what's your name? And I was like, are you chatting me up? She goes, yeah. And I'm like, Zav. And they're like, oh, where are you going? I started talking. She goes, she goes, um, why let's hang out? And I goes, take my number. No, in fact, she goes, give me your number. So I shouted my number out. She was in the passenger seat, shouted my number out. And she took the details, called me later on that night. And then she's like, look, let's go out. Came back, met up, went out um, in the West End. And then um, I went down to, you know, we started hanging out. When I used to go down to um, their house, was they had this house that they put them in in Maidenhead. Used to hang out at the house and all that kind of stuff. You know, we dated for a while and just, it was a bit of a mad one. It's like, it's like a whirlwind relationship. And then um, when you say, when you say we dated, who's we? Have a guess. The obvious would be Scary Spice. There you go. Which one of them would have pulled up next to a person on the motorway and shouted out whatever. <laughs> so scary, um, Mel B. So we dated for a while and I went on tour with James Taylor Quartet in 1994, traveled and came back and fell out of contact and everything else came back. And I remember I was watching Chris Evans um, Friday night show. And um, he goes, um, the new um, girl sensation, the Spice Girls. And they came on and I was watching it because they didn't, they didn't actually, um, I'm not sure if they had the name then, but they had the concept and whatever else. And it was in the house working. And I was watching it and I was like, Oh my goodness, that's Mel. And I literally tried to call her and obviously everything was gone. And by the time I actually met up with her again, it was like about two years later. And it, we, I met her at the, um, I met her at Des O'Connor's show when I was doing backing vocals for um, Dinah Ross, pure name dropping, clang, clang, clang. Oh, Dinah Ross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. I was doing backing vocals for wow. her. And then, um, um, she, the Spice Girls were singing on the show as well. So I was there with this choir and we stood up this choir and I saw the Spice Girls come down and again, everybody was like, oh my God, that's the Spice Girls. It's the biggest thing ever, ever in history. And I was stood down there and I was just looking up and I think to myself, flip me, man, I used to date that girl. She's looking up at them and then she goes, she looked down at me, she goes, Zav. I was like, no. She came running down, her and baby Spice. Emma came around and hugged me like that. And everybody was like, you know them. Mental, mental. But like we, we fell in and out of touch and all that kind of stuff. But it was, um, it was a moment. It was a good moment. Well, you obviously separated on good terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never a drama. I mean, every time I'd seen her um, prior to that, it was all laughs and smiles and just like, hey, how you doing or whatever else. Um, and like, I still see um, Baby Splash. She's uh, married to a, a guy that I know and we, Every time we see each other, it's, it's really cool. Anyhow, so um, just doing a whole bunch of traveling and touring. I love touring. I love uh, making music. Um, met this girl when I was in Ibiza. She goes to me, listen, there's this guy I think you should meet. His name's Carl Brown. So I was like, all right, cool. Met up with him. He's a producer. And um, he produced this, um, he just produced music. And that, that stage they was trying to establish, house music was big, but we wanted to establish garage music. So um, we started to do this um, project. Me and Carl just went in the studio and working on stuff. And then we did this um, track called Tumbling Down, which was an underground, um, more darker vibe, but underground garage thing. And um, he goes to me, Zav, you need to come and listen to this thing because it's actually blowing up. And I'm like, whatever. So um, music's playing, Craig David, Tina Moore, and all these other artists were all added to this whole garage thing. So then um, we did another track called um, Just Gets Better, which um, he I did with him, a guy called Matt Jam Lamont, um, um, Gavin Mills and his partner as well. So it was like TJR featuring Xavier, Just Gets Better. Is that, uh, dearly need some time. Is that that one? Yeah. Man, <laughs> come on, brother. <laughs> That's a big tune. Now, the thing is, because I was always on tour, I didn't realise what was happening with the track because I was always away and Carl was calling me out. He's like, Zab, the tune is blowing up. It's the biggest thing on the underground. And I was like, stop hyping, bruv, stop hyping. So never forget it. One day, it was um, 95, went to a Ministry of Sound, turned up, he put me in the guest there, turned up and he was like, yes, you're here. So literally I walked in, walked into the booth and he goes, the next track, I'm going to play this one and I'll mix it in. So literally he mixed in the track and it were, 
But yeah, give me some of your time. And I stood there with my own eyes and my own ears and saw people go ballistic. And I was like, huh? Mm. Pulled the track once, crowd was going mad. Played it again, pulled the track twice, crowd was going mad. He pulled it, played it three times. And I stood there in the booth and I was like that. And I was like, what the hell? So people were singing it like crazy and everything else. So that was that was a moment in time. And the, and the funny thing is, is that there's a lot of people that know me now and they might hear this podcast and be like, Zav, you sang that tune? I'm like, you know I do music, innit? You know I sing, innit? So how do you not know that? And they're like, we just never do and all this kind of stuff. Well, you're a humble guy. So, you know, I did it for me. And now, <laughs> and, and the thing is, I was, I was in clubs after that. I used to go to places like Coliseum and um, The End and um, places in um, Epping, Epping Forest Country Club and all these other places. And just like hanging out and they will play the tune and I'll be stood there with my mates singing it and they wouldn't notice me. And I just sat down there just like, only if they knew this was me. And the energy that I got from watching people celebrating something that I did, mm. right? And they didn't know because it's just, because if they know now, then it's like they're slightly embarrassed, slightly this, but they didn't know. And I was just there and I'm just like, ah. and I'm thinking to myself, this is me. And, <laughs> and, it, and it was the, it's the most surreal feeling uh. because I got to enjoy it with other people without them knowing that it was me. How did you contain that? I couldn't, I, I, I'll give you a story. There was this um, one time, my, my dad, when I became, um, when I started music, he was really disappointed in me because he wanted me to be an engineer, something that was credible apparently. Um, I did this thing on television where I started doing extra work, ad works and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and I told my family I was on this, um, this, this, sh this show. What I forgot is that the shows have to be edited. And just because I was on it, it doesn't mean I'm going to make the edit. And I told them and the show came, sat down and my brothers are cruel. And it was like, the show's almost coming to an end. And I figured to myself, I'm, I know I'm in this. I know I'm in this. And my brother was like, look, look, I just saw you. And I was like, where? It goes, the lamppost. I was like, okay. Show finished and I wasn't on there. My brothers <laughs> battered me for days. Again. And I, yeah, <laughs> literally. <laughs> And the lesson learned from that was don't talk about something until you realize it. Because that way you don't have to suffer the embarrassment, right? And that way you don't build up the tension that they, and the expectation on you. So I just let it go. So when um, um, there was one time I was um, in, in my house um, and I did the, um, I was on this show called Desmond's. Um, the, very the, the barbershop. Yeah, yeah, the barbershop. Yeah, Desmond's. I was on Desmond's, right? And um Chill Winston. Yeah. Yeah. Chill Winston. Chill. <laughs> yes, mate. So Shirley was having um um she was doing this thing where she was um becoming a, a minister. Now my my family always sat down and watched it. The whole family used to sit down and watch it. Now my dad's a minister, my mum's a minister. So they was like, oh wow, this episode's amazing. So they're sitting down watching it. What they didn't know is that in the um the first edit when it when the camera came in it showed a choir and shirley walking in and she stands on the pulpit and it's panning across the choir right and the choirs and like there's all this singing and it's like um i sing because i'm happy i sing because i'm free his eyes is on the sparrow and i know he watches me so i was singing that yeah but they didn't they didn't know um, that it was me because it was panning. So the camera's panning across slowly. You can hear me singing, but you can't see me. I'm sat down in front of the TV. Everybody's behind me, my brothers and everybody else behind me. I'm sat down in front of the television, television's here. And I'm dying inside because I know that this is happening. I know like the last time you guys killed me because it wasn't on, but I know I'm in this because I can hear me and I'm good. And the camera starts panning around and they're like, oh, that looks like such and such. And that looks like, oh my goodness, that's Diane. And the camera came around to me and it stopped on my face <clears> and I'm singing and they were like, and it, it literally, it was like the house just went like this. <sighs> oh my God. 
Everybody started screaming. My brothers jumped on me. Everybody like, oh my God. And it just went ballistic. The house phone started ringing. My dad was looking at the television like this. My mum was looking at the television. She's like, I don't understand. How are you in the television and you're sat down in the living room? So I was like, <laughs> I was like it's television. So literally we was there and we were just having this absolute mental moment. And people were just like, oh my God. And then my dad, went out after that because he rubbished the whole thing that I was doing. My brothers went out and because it was, it's like four channels and everybody was like, Zav, you're famous. And I was like, wow. And then I became that guy. And that was when I was um, 23. So at that point in my life, I was like touring, going all around the world. I was on television. Um, at that time I got a Nat West advert as well. So adverts, they were just like playing 30 times a day. So I was on this Nat West advert with this girl and people were like, oh my God, you're famous. And I did, um, I'm going to tell you this, you probably won't believe me. Do you, do you remember um, a sanitary um, advert, um, body form, the body form advert? Whoa, body form, body form for you. <laughs> that one. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, sorry about the vocals, man. Okay. I teed you up nicely for that, didn't I? <laughs> wow, that was you. I did that. Mate, <laughs> oh, I fucking love that. And the fact that I remember it as well. Exactly. And we would sing that I at did. school. That was you, my man. All right, let me let me confess something. Mates of mine, right, producers, they were like, um, I used to go around and do some music with them. I used to do some um, session vocals for them. So I went in there into the studio in Labrick Grove and they goes to me, um, you'll never guess who left here, Zav. And I was like, who? So when you walk into the studio, you actually walk into the booth first, and then you walk into the studio. So I walked into the booth, and I was in the booth, and I was like, yo, boys. And they're like, Zav. And I was like, what's going on, man? They go, you'll never guess who we had in here. And I was like, who? They goes, the body form woman. And I go, shut up. What? And I did exactly what you guys just did there. So I sang it, <laughs> right? And they cracked up and they go, you're a freak. They go, do it again. So I sang it again. And I was like, anyhow, come on, bro. Let's get, let's get this done with and whatever else. So got the session done, paid me my money, left and went home. Three weeks later, they, um, one of the guys ran me up, um, Christian and Marcus, the guy's, the guy's name. Um, um, Marcus ran me up. He goes, Zav, listen, need to talk to you. I goes, yeah, cool. What about? He goes, listen, um, do you remember you came to the studio the other day and did that session? He goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, love that. He goes, at the beginning of the session, you sang, do you remember you did that body form thing? I goes, no. He goes, you sang body form. I goes, yeah, 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 of course. They go, okay, so we recorded that. And I'm like, you idiot, what do you do that for? He goes, oh, we just did it because we thought it'd be funny. He goes, but there's a, an issue now. And I goes, what do you mean? He goes, we sent your vocal with the original vocal to the producers, right? To um, to um, the, the company that was doing it. I can't remember the names now, but, um, and they said they absolutely love it, but they want this version. I'm like, yeah, whatever. I put down the phone. And they ran back, we go, Saf, what are you doing? I goes, bro, you keep taking the mick out of me. <laughs> whatever in it, you're gonna read it. And I put the phone down and he messaged me, he goes, Zav, I'm gonna call you again please don't put down the phone. So I was like, Sigh. so he called me and I'm like, he goes, bruv, I promise you, swear on this, I swear on whatever. And I was, I was like, bruv, are you serious? He goes, yeah. And he goes, and they want to see you, bruv. Um, Aerodel is the um, name of the company. So I goes to him, I goes to him, I don't understand. He goes, look, there's a session, right? Where they want you to come and record it again. And it's in, um, it's in, um, in the West End. So I'm thinking to myself, no. And he goes, bruv, please, they're going to pay you good money for it and whatever else. Fine. So turned up at this thing, I had a rucksack on my back because I was going somewhere else afterwards. So I walked into this room and it's this humongous studio, huge. And it had an operation room at the top. There's just like a, it's like a, all these execs were sitting at the top. There's about, um, there's about seven people upstairs. And my mates were in the, the lower half of me. They're like, Zav, okay, cool. We just set it all up and let, um, let us know when you're ready. I'm like, bro, what am I doing here? And they're like, you know what? Look, just just sing the thing because they they um they want they they, they don't believe it's you. And I'm like, what? 
And he's like, yeah, they thought it was the girl, but we told him it's a guy and it's a black guy. And they thought we were having a laugh because that's what we do. And I was like, rough. I was like, oh, all right, cool. So I walked, then I walked into the room and saw everything and I was like, oh no. And I was like, this is really, really happening. So uh, um, a button gets pressing, pressing is like, hello, Zabi, do you need anything? I'm like, no, no, I'm all right. It's like, okay, um, when you're ready in your own time, thank you. And then the music came along, but to let that, but, but, and I was like, no. And all I heard was a round of applause. Mm. And then the room emptied. And there goes, bro, you got that. I made so much money from that advert. I was confused. They would ring me up and they'd go, the Spice Girls want to use it on their tour. How much do you want for it? And I was like, how much are they offering? They said, um, a thousand. I goes, 1500. They go, let's, we'll find out. Yeah, you got it. We'll put it in your account. Um, Boyzone won it. Um, All Saints won it. This person won it. That person won it. And then the adverts were playing in the residuals. I was like, literally just hit a vein of form and music became everything. I was on stage and I was performing for people. I was, um, I did this album with this particular band um, and we'll go out and do shows and just people coming and singing your song, which was just like surreal. I'll do PAs for the um, the garage stuff and have people singing the stuff for me. Cause like there's a part of it of um, Just Gets Better that is, it's not the radio with it, but I scat at the beginning. So I do this thing where I go, zidum bum bum wheeze it did it and day. The bum 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 brain, zid it bum bum brain. Yeah. So I do this thing. Now it was an absolute vibe that I did once. It's a one-off. And when I was doing I, Epin Forest Country Club, I'll never forget it. I was at the front and then um it's like dip, 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 dip. and then I started, I was like, zidum bum bum wee. And there's these two white guys stood in front of me and they were singing. So I stopped and I gave them the mic and they did the whole thing. And I was like, it, it's the most, it's the most overwhelming thing or one of the most over, overwhelming things that I experienced. I'm like, you took the time to learn that. I did that once. I don't even remember that. I have to, and they're like, they're like, we love it. And I was just like, this music business is an absolute thing. So took me around the world was able to meet some phenomenal people, um, sang at Glastonbury. Um, I was on one stage, Oasis was on the other stage with the band. My band left the stage and they left me alone in the stage to do this crowd participation part. And I was like, um, I was like, wave your hands in the air and all this kind of stuff. And they was doing that thing. And I was like, listen, I need to take a picture of this because one day my grandchildren, I will tell them about this and they won't believe me. And I got my camera and I, I was present. Yeah, yeah. And I took pictures, 1994, still got them at home. Just like, I look at them and that whole thing, I can put myself back on stage in front of 10,000 people with just a thought. And literally it was the most amazing thing. And just the career just kept on going and kept on going. And I worked with people like um, Candy Statton doing the whole Young Hearts and you got the love. Um worked with, traveled with um, Robert Palmer, did a three month tour of America with him. And um, might as well face it, I'm addicted to love. Um, did that whole thing, worked with um, David Guest. He did this extravaganza and he had all these old school um, mm. soul legends on Percy Sledge, um, Benny King, um, James Ingram, most of them are past now, but I got to sing back in vocals for these guys, which was, you know, when you see Percy Sledge walk up and go, when a man loves a woman, I'm like, that's actually Percy Sledge. Mm. And I got to work with these guys, Benny King, Stand By Me and all this kind of stuff. And it was my everyday, it was my normal. Um, in latter years, um, I started to do X Factor. I did X, sang an X Factor for like 11 years. Um, and what would happen is um, every song that they make, they had to recreate it. So they couldn't, you couldn't just do the original. You couldn't take a backing track. You had to go into the studio and recreate it. And I was saying, went with a group of singers and done that. And then in, I think it was 2016, um, I got a phone call and they said, listen, we're going to be doing Judges Houses. Do you want to go and do Judges Houses and sing on that? And I'm like, Nah, not really. I'm because I'm always trying to shy away from the public eye because I'm like I'm good. I just don't want to hassle. Don't I don't need the eyes. 
excuse me. So I went and did it and X Factor was the biggest show on television at oh. the time. And literally my phone went ballistic and people were like, oh my God, you're this and blah, blah, blah. And because I'm very distinctive in my look, it was, um, it was a lot. So I got loads of other work from there. Um, and then I would do like acting work as well, studied acting for a little while and um, had a little few bits and pieces. Then I, I got this role in The Dark Knight and casted for it, got a little role, just a little speaking part. So in The Dark Knight, they've got that long table, right, where they're in the kitchen and the Joker comes in, all the gangsters are sitting around the table making a plot and plan for, you know, what we're going to do about, um, about Batman. And then the Joker comes in, he's like, <laughs> Heath Ledger. Mm. So I was sat down here, Heath Ledger comes in and he does his stuff and um, um, James Cameron, who is probably one of the greatest um, film producers ever, um, was there. And I'm like, I'm sat down in this environment. I got cast and I got put there and I got quickly removed because he was like, I stand out too much. So then they blackened my beard and they put me in the background, but I was still in the scene type thing. And being in that environment with these actors and the best, one of the best um, um, film producers ever, you know, to do it, just like, I am so privileged. I'm so blessed. And the film came out. I didn't tell anybody again mm. because of how my brothers traumatized me when I was young. And I went to watch a the film with my then friend and we watched it on the 40 foot screen and literally um, not that scene because in that scene I was supposed to be and I got moved to sit in the chair behind. She didn't really see me. And then like the scene, um, the actual scene that I did get seen in, I filled up the whole <clears throat> screen with one other character and it was just me on the screen like that for about three seconds. I got phone calls for about three months from all over the world. Like, oh my God, I can't believe it. So I've always been in the public eye. I've always done music. I've always done film. I've always done television. I've always done radio and I've never wanted to. And it's weird how something that I tried to walk away from or run away from always grabbed me and pulled me back. So um, incredibly long-winded answer. When I walked away from music, it was because music started to be about different things. Um, um, the quality of music disappeared, the clubs disappeared, um, the the energy in clubs disappeared, the dress, the way our people used to dress and carry themselves, all of that stuff disappeared. And I fell out of love with, and I never thought I would, but I fell out of love with music. And I was like, I don't like what people are singing about. Um, there used to be love songs. There used to be, in the 90s, I listened to, I listened to, um, Every genre of music there was available was the best in the 90s. So I would, even now you play Oasis in Jamaica, you play Oasis in Jamaica, Jamaicans are singing it out full blur because it's quality music. You can play Blur, you can play Pearl Jam, you can play all these rock bands mm. because they were the best of the best. Then you can go to the extreme, right? And then you can play um, country and Western, you can play um, disco, you can play whatever type of music. And it was just the best of the best artists at that time. And music was phenomenal throughout the nineties, but then into the twenties, it started dropping off. And then garage music turned into two-step, turned into grime, turned into other stuff, which I wasn't a, too much of a fan of, but I appreciate the amount of money and the amount of kudos that people created from what we established and people like myself established early doors. But I just lost the passion of it. And for me, if I don't love it, I'm not doing it. It doesn't matter how much money it makes. It doesn't matter how much people can give me. If I, if there's no passion involved, I can't do it. That's interesting to hear that from somebody that's in the industry, because I switched off from modern music. I love music. I would rattle off some names. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe when, you know, when you was hitting the high notes, I was, I, I was, I was picturing third world. Yeah. Come on. Hooked on love. Now that we found love. Yeah. I'm just thinking you, this, you know, you're, you're up there with them. Uh, yeah, John Denver, John Holt, completely yeah. different, but yeah. music mad. And I love the substance of it, the meaning. I listen to the words. I want Correct. to I want to connect to the song. I want it to bring me to tears. If that's what it's meant to do, I want it to really, really do its job. And the older I've got, the more current music, I'm thinking, is it just because I'm getting old or, or does it not hit the spot anymore? And it just doesn't. 
and you've confirmed that because you was in it. You could have quite easily carried on just because you love music, but something changed and you thought, well, I don't like this anymore. Yeah. Soul music was called soul music for a reason. Because it's music for the soul. Mm. Rhythm and blues. All these music, genres of music, it was called what it was called because of what it was feeding and because of what it was doing for you. Even rap music back in the day was better than it is now. I mean, a million times better than what it was. And it had a message. There was substance to it. So the older we get, the more we see now the advent of all these newest things and music is not. You can play Michael Jackson's album right now and you can, the quality of it is phenomenal. Mm. The, whatever music system you play on it, will, it will be ridiculous. Just like a lot of garage music, but the stuff that they're releasing nowadays is just, not even just nowadays, but it's been for a while. It's just <clears> not <throat> as, it doesn't connect in the same way. And because younger people don't know better, then they just like, okay, they're cool with that. So I've gone in places, I've gone into clubs and they start playing garage music and the whole place just goes upside down. It just goes ballistic because everybody's like, ah, because of the energy, the vibe and everything that came with that. Mm. And if you start playing some of the more modern music, then it's like, it's, I mean, people go hype for it, but it's a different kind of hype. It's an aggression. It's a, it's just like a, a whatever, a drug fueled situation or not. That is exactly how I perceive it. And I listen to this shit, sorry, to some of you. I listen to this shit and I think, well, you've got to be on drugs to even <laughs> consider listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> literally, literally. Yeah. And, it, and it's one of those things. And just um, now, that, now that you mentioned that subject, I went throughout my whole music career, nearly 30 years, um, not doing any drugs whatsoever, not drinking alcohol, not smoking, not whatever. And it was freely available and readily available around me all the time. And it was, people asked me how, and I was like, because I was getting off on the music. And I was getting off on what was feeding my spirit and my soul. Mm. And I had no desire to feed my body these crazy substances that I couldn't vouch for to get me into a place that my spirit and my soul took me to anyhow. So I'd been able, I can get to a place of nirvana just by sitting down and thinking about it and just be, and just by doing the whole meditation, I can get to that place. Whereas this, other people that needed to take drugs in order to get there. And I'm like, that's not necessary. And I've been able to show people how, again, I keep running on tangents, but this is how my brain works. Another person says to me, um, I'm a recovering addict. I'm like, I don't know what that means. He goes, I'm a recovering addict. I goes, okay, cool. How long have you been in recovery for? He said, 10 years. All right, cool. At what point are you recovered? He's like, what do you mean? At what point are you recovered? He said, I don't get it. I goes, my car breaks down. I call the recovery. And they recover, recover the car. But my car doesn't stay in recovery for 10 years. And he's like, yeah, you get it fixed. And then what happens? Then you put it out on the road. But my car doesn't suffer from the issue that it had previously. It might suffer from a new one, but not the same one because it got recovered, fixed, and it moves on. So at what point are you recovered? And the guy sat down there and he couldn't answer me. And he's like, I've never ever thought about it like that. Because you're defining yourself by it, so you will never recover from it. Whereas for 10 years, it's not been a thing. I walked away, I left him in that space because I'm not trying to say anything other than challenge the way you think about a thing. I have to agree. Now I've spoke to addicts in the past and they've said to me, cause I'm 100% your side of the fence when it comes to how you perceive your habit or your addiction, no matter how small or large it may be. But I have also spoke to addicts mm -hmm. that have said to me, I need to be reminded that I'm an addict. I need to, I need to be told that I'm still in recovery because if I don't feel like I'm still an addict or I'm, I'm no longer in recovery, yep. I could be inclined to relapse and then my life takes a devastating turn. So to keep themselves in check, they tell themselves they're an addict still, they're in recovery. They're a recovering alcoholic, a, a recovering cocaine user, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. And I've, challenged their narrative as well. And I've said, well, 
I've got a very addictive personality. And it's funny, I connect with podcasts with sobriety because I know I can't afford to be hungover, uh, lethargic, brain fog. It'd be very disrespectful to you if I turned up not on my A game and not gave you my undivided attention. If I was giving a substance my attention, even in equal measures to you, I'll I'll be doing you a very poor service. I could say that I'm a recovering addict. I I could say I'm in recovery. I have partied probably as hard as some of them rock stars that you've you've sang with. Yeah. I have taken the piss. But never once when I decided, well, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to party anymore. Never once did I say to my friends, I'm in recovery. Yeah. Because then I in my mind, and I know everyone's different, but I feel like I've created a problem that wasn't actually there. I took the piss, I overdone it, I checked myself. And yeah, sure, there's a reason why people have hair of the dog. It's to take away the edge of the anxiety, mm-hmm. which is the withdrawal. Correct. But you have to go through that. And then once you go through that and you're not craving it anymore, are you in recovery or are you, or are you just over the last session when you fell off the wagon? So I'm in a position now where I've got, and it's all relationships in it. Correct. You know, you go and see a life coach, a psychotherapist, a counsellor, and you say, look, you know, I, I'm, I'm using drink and drugs too much to mask whatever it is. They'll yeah. ask you, what's your relationship with cocaine? What's your relationship with that? And it's then you think, shit, yeah. If I'm using something and that then becomes my company because I've run out of drinking buddies, I'm in a relationship. I have a relationship with that substance. And you don't want that substance to be the leader of that relationship. Well, you don't want it to be the leader for for a single day, let alone the rest of your life. And when you've separated and divorced from that partner, because if you're in a relationship, that's a partnership. Mm -hmm. If you're divorced... Why on earth do you still want them lingering in your sentences 10 years later? I'm in recovery. I'm a recovering addict. So for me, I'm in a position, and I'm saying this so that anyone out there that's in a similar boat to me can relate and they can shift the tag if it's not necessary. Yeah. You've just parted too hard for too long. You've now decided I'm going to leave longer gaps between the last session until it no longer affects my life and there's a bit of a balance. And if you do then have a drink at Christmas or a birthday or an occasion and you do take the piss again, you haven't become an addict again. Correct. You've just fallen off the wagon or you've just had a party. Good luck to you. I hope you enjoyed it. Get some sleep the following night, order a Domino's pizza, get over it, move on, and do not identify it as something that you're not actually. I'm so glad you 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 get it as well from that perspective. Let's be clear again, I have to say this just to make it idiot proof. There are exceptions to everything. Agreed, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I have to we we have to say that there totally. are exceptions to everything. You just don't want to be the exception. Mm. But I do understand that there are people with chemical imbalances in their brain and in their body that doesn't allow for them to use the cognitive um, abilities that we have on the cognitive tools. But when I, my point was just to, because like the whole music business became an addiction to me. So I became addicted to being on stage. I became addicted to the adulation. Um, I never realized, and um, um, artists will will, will, um, confirm this, I didn't realize that I was suffering from depression. Right. There's something that happens when you are on tour, on stage, being celebrated, being shouted um, for, being screamed for, being adulated by girls, having women screaming you at women, throwing panties at you, asking for autographs and all this kind of stuff. People singing your songs, people singing your name, people having cardboard um, cutouts with your name on it. I love you, whatever, whatever. And then being taken out of that and then dropped back in Alperton Mm. to nothing. One extreme to the other. And I never realized that I suffered many depressions every single time I came home. And I dealt with it because I was just like, oh, I'm just, home i just i just miss that but it's like no it's what happens when you give somebody everything Mm. and then you drop them back into not nothing but you drop them back into into a into much less and you're ignored so your mates don't call you the mates don't come around because they just think oh you're on tour you're doing stuff you're doing this you're doing that so you're left alone and at those points i was like i'm lonely because i want to be around people because that's what i just come from and then my itinerary was sorted, my, my, 
my um, cars come for me, this happened, that happened, this happened, and then all of a sudden nothing. And you're like, where is everybody? Hello? Room service? Hmm. Um, stage hand? <laughs> um, literally, you're there thinking to yourself, I'm gonna have to go back to doing this by myself again. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of people, artists, um, um, take drugs. Um, I've been around artists that have taken every, every form, heroin and crack and cocaine and weed and mushrooms and all that kind of stuff. I pretty much tell you what effect it has on everybody. Oh, it has on people, everybody's different. And but I've never taken any. Same way with alcohol, we would go to um, restaurants and they would ask me to order the alcohol because I knew everything about it, just didn't impart. I've never been like even tempted. I've had um, a group of guys put down um, uh, a pint of beer and they put, they, I, put, I think they put down nearly a thousand pounds if I downed it, the beer. And I was like, that's just like me, you saying to me, jump off a, a bridge. It's like, it's not gonna happen. I mean, there's no, there's, I said, there's not even a temptation. At least tempt me with something that I want because you can't be tempted with something that you don't want ultimately. So because of that, and, um, and, and let me go even further back and tell you why I don't have an addictive nature, even though the, um, the stage thing was really overwhelming. It's because anything that I really wanted, I didn't get as a young person. And if I had something that I really loved, my brothers would take it from me. So I would learn to not be too attached to anything. So I would never be attached, so attached to something external that if someone took it, I'd be devastated. Everything that I built attachment to is in here. And I'm like, you can't mess with my thoughts. You don't know what I'm thinking. You can't mess with what's going on in my heart. So those are the areas that I put most attachments to. So I'm like, I'm not gonna be addicted to alcohol because if someone takes that away from me, I'm lost. I can't be addicted to stage because if someone takes the stage away from me, then I'm lost. So I then learned that I had to stop being so reliant on external things, but be more dependent on me as a person, as a human. And then that's when you start to, again, do the, the self work and, and, and figure out what it is. So eventually when I walked away from music, as difficult as it was, I know what I was walking to. And then I sat down again, like I did before I did music. I sat down for almost a year um, doing not much. And um, I was sat down and just one, literally just meditating, it just popped in my spirit. It was like life coach. So what do you mean? Like life coach, I, I talk to myself blatantly. <laughs> I do. My mum used to do it and I used to wonder why. I thought and, it was just me. And then, <laughs> after my mum passed away, I was like, I know why now. And I was like, what does that look like? It doesn't matter. Because most people struggle um, because even when I left my engineering job to do music, I didn't know that music was it. I didn't know how I was going to do music. I just knew that if I put myself in the environment, then music will happen. I didn't know what life coaching was going to look like, but I just knew that I've got a platform. I've got, you know, like I think about like 4,000 followers or whatever. I'm just going to speak on that. I'm going to speak about stuff. And I just did it. And when I started doing it, everybody battled me, battled me and pushed back, pushed back. And that's when I said I, I built my muscles as it were. I was in the gym mm. and I was sparring every day, all day. And I became phenomenal. My fitness game was insane, insane. People would say stuff and I'd have a rebuttal for it. Everything just come like that, just come like that. You can't touch me, you can't touch me. And I was like, this is what happened when my brothers were making me sit down and listen. And that's why I can do, I can multitask. And I was just doing this thing and it's, and, and I'm like, now I'm using my brain. Whereas music, I was just using my, my skill. I was just performing I, and I, and I'm like, that's a bit much. It's not enough no more. And like, and plus I'm getting old. The people like, I'm going for auditions with 20 year olds and I'm like 40. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. Pulled away from it. And then literally I just looked inside and every time I do, every time I pull away from something, I'm like, what do you love? What are you passionate about? What do you care about? What would you, what makes you angry? What makes you frustrated? And when people ask me, how do I find my passion and purpose? Those are the questions. What do I love? What do I hate? What do I fear? What do I, am I passionate about? What would I do if I had a billion pounds? What this, and when you start answering those questions, you come about answers. And 
I got into this space where I was just like life coaching. I started doing it and I didn't realize what it looked like or what it sounded like, but I just knew that I had to do something. I had to follow mm -hmm. this path. And it was an internal path that was beaming out ahead of me. And when people started reaching out to me, the first person that reached out to me, I'd like to book an appointment. All right. Um, how much do you charge? I was like, um, I'll get back to you. And I was like, somebody wants to pay money to talk to me. And the the whole um, life coaching thing um, kicked off there. And people were still calling me back to music. Dad, you need to still do music. You need to still do music. But it's that same thing that happens when um, clients of mine or friends of mine who were drug dealers for argument's sake, and they're off the road now. And they was doing naughty stuff, but people are still trying to drag them back to the road or the allure of it or the money and whatever else. And they're like, I just want to reform my life. I just keep saying no. Yeah, but the money and this and the that. Keep saying no. Mm. Keep saying no. And after a short while, you will tell you what your truth is. Because they're trying to remind you of what your past is. In your present, you're trying to create a better future. So keep creating. So that's what I did and just stuck with it. And I just said, I love music, but I just don't like the music industry. I don't like the music business. And I just kept at this um, coaching thing and then slowly but surely music disappeared and it got quieter, as you said, the, the noise got quieter and then people started to listen to my coaching. And as I said earlier on, the first time I changed my name and somebody called out and said, Zabi, the life coach, I, I wanted to cry. I literally wanted to cry because I'm like, I've made the transition. Mm. I've done it. I'm here. I'm a, I'm a life coach. And then the abuse started. <laughs> and you thought, what the fuck have I done? Exactly. I, was, I was singing with Robert Palmer last week. <laughs> <laughs> they the spice girl the other year. Now look at me. But it's, it's when you say yes to you, you say yes to you with all, all the faults, with all the, um, with all the confusion, all the indecision, with all the doubt, with all the fear, with all the love, with all the, you say yes to you in every area. And I did that. And that's allowed me to experience the best version of me. And the reason why I'm telling, saying all this stuff as well, because I'm hoping that people that hear this, right, will be able to hear parts of our story and be like, okay, cool. I'm, I'm fed up of making, I'm fed up of making excuses because we can. Mm. But rather than make excuses, make plans. And you don't have to know, you just have to start. And then law of attraction, which even if you don't believe in it, it's the thing, brings the right things, people, time, situations to you. Cause it's happened to me throughout my life and it's not a coincidence. It's just, you know, energy as it were. You just attract all these things to you. So everything that's happened to me is because of me. Good, bad, and indifferent, I own everything. And you think that this was your absolute destiny? This was meant to happen? 13 years old, I told my dad and my dad mm. ignored me. And then as a grown man now, I'm now experiencing it. And I'm like, I feel like as though, and feeling's a bit of a loose thing to say, but I know this is where I'm supposed to be. And my feelings confirm that. So I don't lead with my feelings because my feelings are constantly changing. But I know what I know and my feelings come into agreement with what I know. And we have this, agreement, arrangement, understanding, appreciation that I know I'm supposed to be doing this, even though I don't feel like doing it some days. Mm. I don't feel like doing it some mornings. I don't feel like doing this, but I know I should. Why do you know? Because it's the right thing to do. My spirit tells me that because I'm so in tune with my spirit, but my body, which is the least of me, feels tired, feels, ah, oh, you know, oh, feels nervous, slightly anxious. It's like, you're anxious for what? And let me throw this in there as well. I ask people what anxiety is. And most people tell me how it feels. And I said to you, no, 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 what is anxiety? And it's the fear of something in the future. And I goes, all right, cool. So if you think about something that's gonna happen in the future negatively, that causes what? They said anxiety. I go, okay, cool. So if, you, if I said to you next week, I'm gonna take you and your whole family to Dubai for um, 10 days, Will that cause anxiety or excitement? It goes, obviously I'd be excited. I go, none of them have happened. But you choose what to focus on. None of them have happened. The only thing you have now is the present. The future's not here, it's the present. So if you start thinking about the future negatively, it causes anxiety. You start thinking about the future positively, it causes excitement. None of them have happened. So that means, and there are exceptions, that anxiety is a choice. 
and they struggle to push back on that. Mm. So I think about the future positively, which causes excitement. If I think about my future negatively, I become anxious. It was almost as controversial as Andrew Tate saying depression isn't real. Do you remember him saying that? Yeah. And the backlash he got. Yeah. So again, there are exceptions to prove that, um, you know, I prove the rule. And there are people who have the, who have a chemical imbalance and are not able to um, function properly. So you need antidepressants, you need whatever, whatever, whatever. I understand what he means. Depression is essentially a lot of the times people looking back at the past and replaying the past, negative past. And then you are in a depression because you're being held down, you're being suppressed by something that happened, not happening, but again, the body doesn't know the difference. And then you keep replaying that and then it brings you into a sad, depressed state. Mm. One of the, the hardest things that I've ever had to deal with in my life was losing my parents. And I could sit down, it doesn't happen now, but if I tried, I can sit down and picture the day when my dad passed and especially when my mom passed because passed, my mom was, I was so close to my mom. My mom was my everything. And I could, I could make myself depressed. I could cry. I could become very frustrated and all that kind of thing. I, I was never ready for losing my mom. Never. And when my dad died, I didn't think he could. I just thought my dad's Thanos. Hmm. You know, he can't die. He's gonna, he's, he's gonna whatever. But we never had a great relationship. But towards um, the last three months of my dad's life, he saw me, actually saw me when we connected. And I saw him take his last breath. And that was, that was powerful. It's one of the most powerfulest things that I've ever experienced, watching him just like literally just take his last breath like this and um i'll never forget it it's like some ash just kind of like um came out of his mouth and it's weird and i and i grab it and it just dissolved in my hand my mum was there and she's like she's like um is he gone and i was like dad dad and she's like is he gone and i was like yeah and then she came and she touched his head and then she went back in the room and started singing and just like just this whole type of energy that she was exuding Mm. My dad lived until he was 84. That's good innings. Yeah. So you have a choice. And again, this perspective, you can mourn his passing, which is like a couple seconds mm -hmm. old, a couple minutes old, or you can celebrate his life, which was 84. And my dad died and, um, sorry, um, did the funeral, phenomenal funeral, a year and a half later on, my mum passed as well. And that was difficult because she was the one person that I didn't, I wasn't prepared to lose. And she um, went to, went to um, work one day, did it, was working on the film, 15 hour day, came back. And uh, when I was at work, sorry, in the morning, she got, she, she rang me, she's like, I'm not feeling good. And I said, what's wrong? She's like, I don't know. I just don't feel good. And my mom's always, um, she was always in good health, 89 years old, but she was, a, she had a brain of a, a 40 year old, just like proper compass mentors. And um, I was worried about calling my brothers, uh, my brothers were busy. I called mum's friend. She came out and looked after my mum. So came home and I was like, mum, you all right? And she's like, she's like, no, I don't feel good. And I go, so, well, look, she, is this a medicine that she would take? I go, look, don't take this medicine. Just go to bed and sleep and whatever. And my mum looked at me. She goes, okay. And she never does that. She'll, mm. if I asked her, if I told her stuff, she'd like, don't tell me what to do. You're not my parents. Leave me alone. So she used to have banter. But this particular time she was like, okay. And I was like, that's weird anyhow went to bed at six in the morning i had a knock on my door and and the lady she's like she's like something's going on with mum i was like what do you mean so she's like come so i went into my mum's bedroom and my mum had kneeled down she had arthritis bad knees she was knelt down beside her bed with her hands like this passed wow she knelt down and she prayed her last prayer. She knew that it weren't going to be, she knew that she weren't going to get up from there because she just never, her knees and whatever else. And she prayed the last prayer and, and passed over. And that was, I, I literally, we buried her and put her, you know, did the whole funeral and that. And I fell apart for three whole months and I mourned. And I would get up in the morning and I would lie down, I'd go downstairs and I'll curl into a fetal position on my um, floor in my living room and just cry like a baby, cry like a baby. And I think what happened at that, that point, I mourned my, 
my sister, my dad, and my mum. Mm. And it was, um, it was something that was incredibly difficult for me because I wanted everybody to mourn my mum because of how important she was to me. But everybody just got on with life. And what happens is when you have a funeral, you get three weeks, I say this, you get three weeks worth of sympathy and empathy. And then after that, you're on your own. Family, friends, whatever, you're on your own. Something, you've got something else to deal with now. And just that as well was something that was so important for me to accept and recognize that I can't expect everybody to experience what I'm experiencing, to feel what I'm feeling for as long as I'm feeling it, because that's not how it works. And I wanted everybody to be angry. I, I wanted everybody to be quiet. Don't laugh. Why are you laughing? Why are you happy? My mum's gone. My mum's gone. And having that experience, I didn't realise just how much it would help me to help other people. But I flipped that on its head and I've given that to people. And I've seen people that have been going through five, six, seven, eight, nine years of trauma, of losing their dad and losing their mum, heal like that in an instance because of what I shared. I goes, what are you celebrating? What do you mean? What are you celebrating? Well, no, so you're not celebrating their life. No, what are you, what are you celebrating? Because I'll tell you, their death. Like, what do you mean? You're sad because you're focusing and thinking about their death. I'm happy because I'm focusing and thinking about her life and what she's achieved and what she's accomplished and what she's done. So I'm saying, whatever you feed will grow, good, bad, or indifferent. And whatever you ignore essentially will die, good, bad, or indifferent. There are extremes, obviously. So I'm saying, I'm feeding the good, that's why I'm good. You're feeding the bad, that's why you're still traumatized some X amount. The person looked at me as to say, I don't want to feel good about it. Leave me in my trauma. I goes, it's a choice. Mm. But as long as you know, when you're ready, there's an out. There's a get out to this. And I've seen people sit down there and they're like, I've defined myself by this thing for the last how many years? How can I let go of this? How can I let go of my mom? How can I let go of that alcohol? How can I let go of this ex, this girlfriend? How can I let go of this? And they won't let go because of the fact that they've defined themselves by it. And then I asked a question like I asked earlier, what are the benefits? And in this silence, and I'm like, at some point, you will let yourself go from this. There's one thing having something, and it's another thing it having you. So if I hold you, I'm holding you, right? And I have you. But if you hold you, you have you, and you can let go of you at any time. If I'm holding you, then you're dependent on me to let go. So I'm like, I'm taking care of me. I'm holding me. I'm protecting me. I'm guiding me. I'm loving me. I'm not giving that to you. So there's a ton of things that people have had to put down and that I've had to put down. There's, um, again, like I said, with the whole um, music thing, when I was, when I was depressed about um, coming home to nothing, and I'm like, Zav, you're thinking about being around nothing. Let's just recap where we were this morning. And I'm like, ah, oh, yeah. I go, you feel better? Yeah. Should we replay that instead of the crap? Yeah, let's replay the good stuff. Thank you. And literally that thing, that theme has been going throughout my whole life with everything. And it's the reason why um, I can come here and be in this environment and you experience my energy and you experience me experience your energy because you, we've done the work and the work is not... It's, 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 it's constant. The work is constant. And as long as you do it, you can benefit from the work. If you don't, then you suffer because of the lack of work. What's the most common problem that people want you to solve for them? I'll answer it this way around. It's about perspective, their perspective, and blame. Accountability. So those are the two things that um, most people struggle with. How they perceive a thing, and who they blame for it. Because like I said earlier, anything that you that you put the blame and the onus on somebody else, they own it, that's theirs, and they control you. So they're outside of you controlling you and doing whatever else. And I'm like, that's too much power. You shouldn't be giving away all your power to anybody like that. And then it's about perspective. So the way how they've seen stuff, and I'm like, I'm like, um, um, like my guy who wrote the book, and I was like, he goes, I got beaten. I goes to him, so did I. 
He goes, yeah, but it was wrong. I goes, was you bad? Yeah. So I was like, that's why I kind of deserve some of it. He goes, yeah, but I didn't deserve all of that. Correct. And some of that's on your mum, for me or my dad. But then I'm not getting beaten. Neither are you. You're a grown ass man. You've got children, right? Yeah. Do you beat your children? Hell no, I'd never beat my children. You've broken the curse. You've ended the cycle. Congratulations. But why are you repeating it in your mind? He looked at me as to say, oh, bro, let me sit with it for a minute. Let me sit with it. If I go, bro, no, you've sat with it for like the last 30 years. Enough. Enough already. I'm like, there's no benefits from this. And then now you're going to look at your, ch your child and you're going, to you're going to treat your child very differently. And this has happened, that they've allowed their child to do every and anything. And the child has got into trouble because of the fact, not this particular guy, but um, other people, because they didn't want to reprimand them because they wanted to be, you know, at peace. And I said to them, listen, here's the issue. Everything that you went through has made you who you are. You're trying to not let your child go through anything. And guess what? That makes them. Not who you are. It makes them a spoiled version of what your perception of what you think they should be is. Whereas you're good. You needed some negative, you needed some positive, you needed some indifference to make you. Like, yeah, but I just don't want, I just don't want. And that goes, anytime you start talking about what you don't want, the foundation you're coming from is a negative one. Anytime you start talking about what you do want, the foundation you're coming from is a positive one. You can get to the same place. I can get you to, obviously you, you have your misses, but I can get a person to their ideal partner by what they don't like in the person or by what they do like in the person, we end up at the same place. Mm. It's just the fuel that you use to get there. It's a negative one. And you're, you're actually taking um, connections from the bad relationships that you had, the bad situation that you've experienced and what you don't want, you don't want. Or I can take it from here, from the good things and the things that you appreciate because then you're smiling at that one, you're grimacing and angry at that one but we get to the same place. I just don't want my journey to be full of crap. I don't want my journey to be filled with anger, frustration, fear, lack and doubt. I want it to be filled with peace. And people don't actually believe that they can have a peace-filled, happy life. They don't believe it. Imposter syndrome type thing. So what would be your, for anyone that's sat through and watched all of this podcast, this conversation that I've thoroughly enjoyed, by the way. Me too, by the way. Yeah, I really have. <laughs> and... People will, will take a lot of strength out of the out of the honesty. Yeah, that's for sure, and the vulnerability that we've both just said here. Yep, this is us. But no matter what they're struggling with at the moment, it could be addiction, it could be a breakup, it could just be you know they've lost their self esteem for whatever reason. Just struggling in general. What would be your what would be your final message to anyone watching at the moment that's struggling? The whole thing about this um, podcast that I wanted to put across was not necessarily my story, but just share my perspective on life and how life is. And one of the main things that I've, um, I, I believe is that we were born into this world with amnesia. We've allowed for things, people, situations, and circumstances to program us, whereas we've always been as a spirit. Now, when you are, when these people are struggling, they're struggling usually because of the fact that they're not being their authentic self and we don't know. So one of the, um, one of the, one of the things that I do, especially with clients who have come to me, they'll know how this works. And I say to them, what do you do for a living? Um, I'm a doctor. Okay, cool. How long have you been a doctor for? Oh, for um, six years. All right, cool. So what's your chosen um, um, field? And they'll tell me. And I'll ask them questions about it and they'll reel it off, reel it off. I go, all right, cool. I go, now tell me about you. Who are you? What do you mean? Like, who are you? Like, um, like, like, what, like, what do I like? Okay, all right, just a second. How old are you? 40. How long have you been a doctor? Six years, been studying for 10. Cool. I asked you about something that you've been doing for 10 of those 40 years and you was waxing lyrical. I'm asking about you, who you've been for all of those years and you're asking me to clarify something? And it's because that people major on what they do whilst ignoring who they are. We're called human beings, not doings. But we define ourselves 
too often by what we do and not who we are. So the reason why people are struggling most of the time because they're defining themselves by stuff that they do and they're not defining themselves by who they are. Nobody can define you. You do that. You allow people through your experience to uh, to perfect you, to sharpen you, to brush dust off certain things. You were mean to me, that taught me this. You were kind to me, that taught me this. So you allow people through the experience to dust you off. But if people came away from the fact of we ain't all the same, we don't all want the same thing. And when I'm in school and I don't understand something from an academic point of view, it doesn't make me dumb because it's just that I hear it from a creative point of view. But if we're all trying to fit into this thing that doesn't fit, then we're struggling. That's what I find a lot of the times when I'm speaking to people, people try to get in where they don't fit in. People try to put on clothes that don't fit them, conversations that doesn't um, fit them. People want me to be angry about things that they're angry about. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm not angry about that. But we want you to be, I'm like, okay, cool. But you don't get to decide what I'm angry about. And if you were more aware of that, then it's perfect. Nowadays, it's harder because you've got social media telling you what to think, telling you how to feel, telling you what to this. And then nobody actually questions themselves because the answers are here. But very few people do the work. Very few people understand that I have everything I need in me already but it's a seed and if you feed it it will grow if you ignore it is essentially it will die final question then <laughs> go on then who are you kind caring loving giving funny empathical a brother a son a father a friend I am all these things and I give them all to me first and then everybody benefits from who I am and who I say I am and who I discover I am and the issues I always say and my clients again will hear this it's not what they say about you that matters it's what you say about you that truly matters and the question is what do you say about you the issue is most people don't say anything or they don't say enough or they'll repeat what other people say, which makes you what they say and not what you say. We get to create, nobody does that for us, but we don't create. So I am all those things, which I'm pointing out love and peace and joy and happiness and all that kind of stuff, but I give them all to me. So it's a reality. It's not just me saying words. I give me love. I give me peace. I give me joy. I give me happiness. I give me kindness. I give me understanding. I give me empathy. And then I give that to other people. So I'm feeding you what I feed myself. And I say, I don't pour out. Literally, I pour in to me and there's an overflow. And everybody that feeds from me feeds from my overflow. So I never pour. There's never a time when I'm empty. Tav? Liam? I could have been here for a lot longer. <laughs> this has been beautiful. And I appreciate your overflow. Thank and, I, you. and you can have some of mine too. And I appreciate you calling me in on this. I've said no to a lot of people. And this was something that my spirit told me that I had to accept. And I appreciate you for asking me. I appreciate you for being persistent as well and wooing me in those voice notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm here and I'm glad I've done it. I'm glad we had the chance to speak. Appreciate you, bro. I got you, man. I got you, man. <laughs>